Palestine. But over a half a million Jews who lived here were determined to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy of Ezekiel, that one day God would gather up their people and rebuild the nation of Israel. This is Kibbutz's Hill in central Israel. It's a commune where everyone shares in the land and pitches in for the general good of the group. But 60 years ago, this peaceful, idealistic community was hiding a military secret. Right under the noses of the British who occupied this area at the time, the Jewish resistance created a top secret weapons factory in the basement of what was, by all appearances, a perfectly innocent laundromat. Located just 28 miles northwest of Jerusalem, the tiny kibbutz of Ayalon would play a huge role in the creation of Israel. I'm about to meet Shlomo Hillel, who actually worked at the secret factory, actually helped set it up. He's right over here. Shlomo. Welcome to Mohan Ayalon, to the Ayalon Institute. Thank you very much. I'm honored. One of the would-be founders of the nation of Israel, Shlomo Hillel, volunteered for the Haganah, a secret Jewish paramilitary organization. Defying hostile Arab neighbors and the occupying British forces, Shlomo put his life on the line, right on this very kibbutz. Right down here? Yeah. Who's after you? So there's a top secret weapons factory under our feet. That's right. It's making a lot of noise. How did they not know it was there? We needed this laundry machine that was supposed to work the whole day long. I see. To make a noise, to cover the noise that might Th have This come. makes a lot of noise? While working, it makes noise. And really? Then... Let me see. Ah, there we go. So that's the noise that's covering that's up noise the factory. Co so absolutely so. That does a good job of it. As part of their cover operation, the kibbutz opened a simple shop and took in laundry from British officers. You were doing the laundry of the British that you were trying to prevent from knowing this. Yes, and they were very satisfied because we did a very good job. <laughs> what would have happened to you if you'd been found out? They would have jailed you. They would have more, more, probably more than that because there was there was death penalty for the creation of armaments. So you're talking about 17-year-old kids. Yeah. 17 to, you were the oldest, 22? I was amongst the oldest. The young people's lives depended on keeping this factory hidden underneath the surface of everyday life. Whoa, look at that. It's so cool. Look at that. We were used to it very fast in those days. Mm -hmm, I'm sure. But it shouldn't have taken a long time. This is a total front. It's amazing. This is an incredible story. This is incredible. It's about eight meters below the surface. Eight meters below, so yeah. about 20 feet below. This is the space set up just as it was in those days. Exactly. The laundry covered an entry shaft down to the bullet factory 26 feet below. Backing onto the laundry and covering a second entrance to the lower chamber was a bakery. The concrete walls and ceiling of the 1,700 square foot factory were reinforced with iron to support the weight of the buildings above. And what were you making down here? Ammunition, only one item, that's bullets for the for the, for the Sten gun. The Sten was a machine gun invented by the British in World War II. It was cheap and easy to mass produce and fired over 500 rounds per minute. The Sten used nine millimeter bullets called parabellums, a Latin phrase meaning prepare for war. Shlomo and the others at the factory manufactured more than two million bullets entirely in secret all in an effort to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy of Ezekiel, to gather up the Jews and build the nation of Israel. Well, this came about in 1945. That was the end of the Second World War. Our people started to understand that there is a possibility, probably a slight possibility, that it will be decided to create the state of Israel after the Second World War, okay. after the Holocaust, 
it will be entirely different because we ha we will have to face the armies of the neighboring Arab countries. Okay, you knew you would be under attack. Today, Israel has one of the most powerful militaries in the world and is still surrounded by bitter enemies. In 1945, the Jewish settlers were practically unarmed and in grave danger. So the men and women of the Ayalon kibbutz decided to do something about it. They built the weapons factory with their bare hands and smuggled in bullet-making machinery from Poland. Tell me how it works. I mean, tell me what you do to make a bullet. Well, the whole thing is on electricity, and it has done a lot of noise when it was working. Whoa. All right. So this is actually how it worked? Yeah. yeah. So these are what came of that raw metal is eventually straight, stretched and punched into a the, into Then a you have to, to cut the size exactly mm -hmm. the, of, of the bullet. We have to circumcise the bullet to, to get it to, <laughs> to the rear. Circumcise the bullet, yeah. right. So all along this line of machinery, there are girls and boys, young men and women, That's right. working in a process they never even knew how to do before they end up in a top secret situation. Above ground, there were thousands of British paratroopers stationed nearby, but the greatest danger was inside the factory itself. If anything would have gone wrong here, there was no exit. And, and walls this to keep have, it in. This could have exploded and, 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 and killed everyone so, inside. So because we are dealing here with powder, with, with, with dynamite. But the bullets still had to be tested. So just a few feet away from the highly explosive gunpowder, they set up a shooting range. So this is your own shooting range. Every yeah. day, the quality of the product is being tested down yeah, here. That's, that's right. <laughs> right that's, inside that's your right. own factory. And uh, to my mind, it was too dangerous. In spite of all the risks, there were no fatal accidents in Ayalon, and they were never caught, a testament to the intensely detailed planning of this subterranean operation. They even had a tanning bed to make it appear as if the workers had been outside, not in an underground factory. Unbelievable. Every detail you had to be worried about. The slightest suspicion could have been the end of all of us. You were living a spy movie. Well, this was part of our life. I mean, at, at that time, we were living because we, we knew it's our job that has to be done, mm. and we did it. Getting the satisfaction that we are doing something that we knew is important for our survival. Awesome. For thousands of years, the words of prophets have shaped the nation of Israel. From the promise of a savior to warnings of warfare and predictions of the future of mankind. The days of prophets are long gone, but as we move into the 21st century, their ancient visions still haunt the future. At 6 a.m. August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall 63 miles southeast of New Orleans. The devastation was deadly. Louisiana's coast and its biggest city were plunged into the dark ages. As global warming causes increased sea level rise, many experts believe the worst is yet to come, and New Orleans is desperate for answers. In a town where even the cemeteries are above ground, New Orleans' underworld may be the key to its survival. From the broken levees... This wall is about 14 inches too long. Wow. Lose one of these segments... And the rest of them And goes. the rest go. ...to the mega engineering projects designed to save the sinking city. We need over uh, 100 million cubic yards of mud. That is enough mud to fill 20 superdomes. New Orleans was saved by heroes who acted bravely as their city was drowning. If we lose this, we lose New Orleans. It's a battle to save New Orleans. This could happen this hurricane season. And the front lines are underground. We're peeling back the layers of time on Cities of the Underworld. Hurricane Katrina. Since Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans is slowly coming back. Devastated neighborhoods are rebuilding. Engineers are hard at work saving the city's broken levees. And New Orleans locals are back to doing what they do best. I'm done well.
Feldman, and I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. And once again, Mardi Gras has taken over this city, and people are partying like there's no tomorrow. And this is good, because in August 2005, many people thought there would be no tomorrow for New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina flooded 65 of the city's 75 neighborhoods and caused the deaths of over 1,200 people. It was the worst engineering disaster in U.S. history. But the fact is, this city has always faced impossible odds simply to exist. Half of New Orleans is below sea level, in many places 10 feet below. It's a harsh reality which has pitted the people of this city against Mother Nature for years. If engineers and scientists don't act fast, New Orleans could be wiped off the map for good. It's a race against time here, and the underground is the key to it all. Half of the city of New Orleans sits below sea level, and the entire city rests on a foundation of mud. Except for the drainage tunnels that keep the city dry, very few man-made structures exist below ground. Yet this unseen underworld has played a huge role in shaping and reshaping the city. Most recently, when Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Katrina roared over New Orleans at 145 miles per hour. But it wasn't the wind that almost destroyed the city. It was water, and New Orleans is surrounded by it. Lake Pontchartrain lies to the north, the Gulf of Mexico to the south, Lake Bourne to the east, and slicing through the city itself is the Mississippi River. All right, take a look at this. I'm standing here looking up at a ship, okay? That ship is in the Mississippi River, okay? So there's the problem. You got water up there and people living down here. Water, people, that's a problem. A few dedicated scientists predicted this disaster and are desperately trying to ward off total destruction a second time. Hurricane Katrina generated the energy of 100,000 atomic bombs. But many people say that was nothing compared to what lies ahead for New Orleans, especially as global warming wreaks havoc on the planet and sea levels are on the rise. Now, the only way to prepare for a perfect storm is to know what to do. I'm about to meet hurricane maverick Ivor Van Heerden. He's the head of Louisiana State University's Hurricane Center. How you doing? Hurricane headquarters, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Originally from South Africa, New Orleans is Ivor's adopted home, and he's passionate about saving it. The Hurricane Center on the campus of Louisiana State University is one of the most advanced storm prediction labs in the world and it's where Ivor has generated a grim prognosis for the city he loves. So this is coastal Louisiana. This is a map that we've generated um, that shows land loss from uh, the 1930s to 2000. What are the yellow areas? The yellow is all the land that's been lost. Since that, 1930? Yeah, since 1930, over a million acres. And you will notice there's a fairly high concentration in the area around New Orleans, mm, which yeah. was very significant during Katrina. This is a dire national emergency. But the land lost along the Louisiana coast is only the beginning. As global warming raises ocean levels worldwide, New Orleans won't be the only city losing real estate to the sea. 53% of Americans live in coastal cities and towns, all of them increasingly in danger from storm surge flooding. Scientists believe the Atlantic may rise another foot by the end of the century. Combine that with a major storm, and Miami, Washington, D.C., and Boston would all be swamped. New York City would lose its entire subway system. All of its major airports and part of lower Manhattan would be under 10 feet of water. But no city is as vulnerable as New Orleans. Even at current sea levels, it was devastated by Katrina's storm surge. So when we saw the streets of New Orleans flooded up to rooftops, that was the damage of a storm surge. That was really the damage associated with the failure of the levee systems. Katrina was a man-made catastrophe. Most people think of Katrina as being as bad as it gets. Not even close, right? Not even close. Katrina missed New Orleans. Huh. If the shoddy levees hadn't have failed, 
we wouldn't be talking about Katrina right now. Wow. Ivor and his team use supercomputers with the power equivalent to 3,000 supercharged PCs. The computers create elaborate cyber models of the New Orleans topography and levee system. Then they can demolish the city with virtual hurricanes of any speed, force, or direction. You merely moved a hurricane like Katrina over toward a direct hit from the west as opposed to where she went, which was to the right, on the east. That's right, and we slowed her down just a little bit mm -hmm. with the eye. Mm -hmm. It's tracking up, tracking up, tracking up. And as it does so, you'll notice all the bright colors. Right. And when it's over, you will see that the whole of New Orleans, everything, is underwater. During Katrina, the world-famous French Quarter stayed dry, but a Category 3 hurricane from the west would be a different story. The storm surge from the Intracoastal Waterway and the Mississippi would create a huge dome of water that would overtop the levees. That water would fill up Bourbon Street, rising 15 feet above sea level, blanketing the rest of the city for miles. There would be no sanctuary. The consequences would have been, instead of 1,600 dying, probably 50,000 died. And you feel sure this would have happened? This could happen this hurricane season. Ivor believes another monster storm is coming, and to protect New Orleans from another tragedy, engineers have to repair its defenses, starting with the underground. To see the problem firsthand, Ivor took me to the front lines of the battle to save New Orleans. Here we go. This water we're on is Lake Pontchartrain. It's a vast body of water on its southern bank, the city of New Orleans. Now, what keeps this water from flowing into New Orleans are levees. They're all along this part of the lake. The fact is, some of them are sinking. Ivor is monitoring these all the time. We're heading across to take a look right now. We're down here, we're at the uh, western flank of New Orleans. So this whole long wall, I can't even see the end of this thing. This is what's protecting New Orleans. This is it. It goes from the Mississippi River to Lake Pontchartrain. This is the 1900 feet of eye wall. Flood walls are a modern alternative to a traditional earthen levee. This type, the eye wall, is simply a straight slab of concrete with a metal sheet sandwiched inside that stretches down into the ground below. A better but more costly design is the T-wall. It rests on a wide concrete pad that is supported by large diagonal piles driven deep into the mud. All of the T-walls survived Katrina. Many of the eye walls failed. Ivor showed me where this eye wall is sinking and separating from the metal support, and how whole 30-foot segments are tilting at an angle. This entire thing is essentially a gigantic weight sitting on soft soil, pushing itself out and lowering down all the while. Lowering down, and compared to adjacent sections, this wall is about 14 inches too low. Wow. And just like one hole sinks a ship, all you need to do is lose one of these segments and the rest of them and goes. the rest go. I mean, would you really want to live on the other side? No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. The only way to fix the levees is to secure them deep underground. It will cost billions of dollars just to replace the eye walls with T walls. Ivor believes these changes, as well as billions of dollars in additional mega engineering projects, have to be made if New Orleans is going to survive. Katrina is a lesson for us. It's taught us that our engineering in the United States isn't up to par when we've got to deal with these things. We are super vulnerable. Up next, an up-close look at New Orleans' underworld. This is how uh, gazelles die in, in Africa. <laughs> yeah, get that on tape. This Mississippi mud may be the cause and the solution for the city's looming crisis. So this is what gives that levee its substance, its structure. That's right. And later, the heroes who saved New Orleans. If we lose this, it's, it's, 
you lose New Orleans. Louisiana is the only state in the union that doesn't have counties. Its political subdivisions are called parishes. Since New Orleans was founded, settlers knew the city lay below sea level. Earth and levees protected it from storm surges, but the real threat didn't come from the water that engulfed it. It came from the soil deep below. I met with Captain Marshall of the Army Corps of Engineers to see how New Orleans is solving this age-old problem. So uh, we're heading out to save some levees, huh? That's right, we see some levees. This for me? That's for you. Thank you. Army Corps of Engineers now, we've got to keep it safe. Oh, I appreciate that. Now, how much levee is surrounding New Orleans? There are 350 miles of levee and flood wall that create the perimeter of protection. That's as far as uh, Houston to New Orleans or San Francisco to LA. In the wake of Katrina, over 16,000 members of the Army Corps of Engineers have been rebuilding these deceptively simple-looking earthwork levees. Levees, embankments built up to prevent flooding, are the skeleton of this city. The earliest versions were natural ridges of earth built up over thousands of years by sediment in the Mississippi. When the French first came here in 1718, they built on that high ground then began to drain the swampland and raise three-foot-high earthworks to protect their reclaimed land. For the next hundred years, the city kept expanding, building more and bigger levees, but it also began to sink. As water was drained out of the wet soil below and more weight piled on top, the ground subsided. The city has fallen roughly two feet every 50 years and as much as 10 feet in places. A giant bowl ringed around by protective levees. And if the levees fail, like they did during Katrina, the bowl fills up and New Orleans drowns. So is this levee complete here? It is complete in terms of its elevation and its general shape. OK. Um, but it still needs some grass to be planted. This levee is basically earth bulldozed into a trapezoid, sometimes as wide as a football field. Grass is planted on top, so the roots will bind the soil together and help fend off erosion. Engineers have to calculate where to build the levees, how tall they should be, and the exact composition of the soil used. One tiny miscalculation and the result can be disastrous. During Katrina, waves overtop the earthen levees containing the industrial canal in New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward. The water scoured away the unprotected backside until the structure collapsed in on itself, breaching in three places. The entire Ninth Ward was flooded, and up to 70 people died. Our levees, our flood walls, and other structures need to be resilient to storms bigger than what they are designed for. That's a very big lesson learned that we learned from Katrina. The key to stronger levees isn't just height, it's what's beneath them. The same soft clay that is causing the flood walls to sink is the perfect raw material for an earthen levee. This massive excavation about three miles from the levee is called a borrow pit, an actual mine for mud and clay. So this whole thing is the borrow pit. The borrow pit. And you basically you're mining mud here. That's what we're doing. This particular borrow pit is 42 acres uh, in size, uh -huh. and the design depth that we're excavating to is about 22 feet. Now, how much mud do you need to do a 350-mile-long levee system? We need over a 100 million cubic yards of mud. I can't even conceive of what that is. Well, I mean, it's a... we, <laughs> we did the math, and we determined that is enough mud to fill 20 superdomes. Now, can we get down there and take a look at that, that if you mud, what, what you're working so hard to get to? If you'd like to. <laughs> All right. The borrow pit is literally the New Orleans underground turned upside down. It's a rare glimpse at the world that lies below the city and the key to saving it. Unlike other major cities, New Orleans doesn't sit on bedrock, but layers of mud, silt, and clay deep below the surface. By digging through its underworld, the Army Corps of Engineers hopes to find out how they can bring New Orleans back to life. Don, this is a good example of what we're looking for. This is clay. All right. 
So this is the stuff, this sticky, slimy stuff. You can tell it's very shapeable and moldable and, and impermeable. So this is what gives that levee its substance, its structure. That's right. And how did you know this was here? Well, we, we came in with, with bores and got a boring sample five feet deeper than the design depth. So we're at 22 feet, you said, here. So they went deeper than that. That's right. And once they were satisfied there was a good rich deposit of clay, this is where they sent in the excavators. They, that's right. So you gotta go pretty deep into the underworld, pretty far underground to find the stuff that's gonna protect the city above, don't you? That's right. You're looking for a certain geological cocktail, mm -hmm. if you will. The recipe for the cocktail is simple. Fine grain soil that can hold water without dissolving. Sometimes the clay has to be dried out before construction because when this stuff gets wet, it's very hard to handle. You're gonna be, yeah, see if you can not sink. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> this is how uh, gazelles die in, in Africa. <laughs> yeah, get that on tape. In our effort to demonstrate the Oh, but the great plasticity of Mississippi clay. I have become stuck like a wildebeest in Africa. There's another element you have to look out for as well. Vegetable matter called organics. And you can see a little bit of organics here. These are bad. You can only have 10% or less than 10% of organics in your geological and cocktail. You're, you're talking about literally rotting plants and That's things right. like that. Yeah, if, if, we, if you have too many, the, the decomposition of these organics can form voids in your levee, right. causing it to fracture over okay. time. Those hairline fractures could be invisible to the naked eye, but during a hurricane, they fill with water. Like an avalanche, the fracture spreads suddenly. The compact section of soil rips away, and the levee fails. Now, since Katrina, what have you been doing differently? After Katrina, we had to be more stringent about our design criteria in our soil selection for our levees. It's just one of the many paradoxes of this complicated city. The soft clay beneath New Orleans that causes it to sink can also be used to protect it. And the storm that almost destroyed it is providing valuable clues to its future salvation. So as storms increase in force, if they do, the building of levees evolves and adapts to science. That's correct. Up next, the heroes who saved New Orleans. It was scary, but uh, we all had a job to do, and we fished in and did it. And later, a bird's eye view of Louisiana's dying wetlands. By 2050, we'll lose another amount of, of land that's equal to Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, D.C. And the unbelievable way the city is trying to save itself. The French settlers who founded New Orleans had the tough job of turning a disease-ridden swamp into a livable city. In addition to the flooding from Lake Pontchartrain, the Mississippi, the Gulf of Mexico, the city has to deal with 60 inches of rainfall per year. That's twice the amount of Amsterdam, another flood-prone city. And for centuries, New Orleans had no real way of moving the rainfall out of here. So vicious epidemics of malaria, yellow fever, and cholera were simply facts of life. Faced with this dilemma, city planners had to find a solution. The answer was underground. In 1878, a yellow fever epidemic killed 4,000 and forced 20% of the population to flee the city. After that tragedy, New Orleans finally committed to a major engineering project that would rid the city of standing water after heavy rains. The city dug 95 miles of interconnected drainage canals and brought in massive pumps to get the water out. A relay system of 24 pumping stations is connected by a vast network of channels, half of them up to 10 feet below ground. Building subterranean canals in this soft soil wasn't easy, 
After the basic channel was excavated, it was lined with sheets of steel. Steel beams were placed across the top to hold the sheet pilings in place. Then concrete was poured in to line the channel, making a structure strong enough to support roads and buildings above, and to funnel 29 billion gallons of water out of the city every day. These canals are some of the only subterranean structures in the entire city. This 90-mile-long subterranean part of the system, much of it over 100 years old, was put to the ultimate test on August 29th of 2005. New Orleans 100-year-old drainage pumps might be the only reason the city still exists today. They're capable of handling over 29 billion gallons of water every 24 hours. That's an Olympic-sized swimming pool every 1.9 seconds. But these massive pumps were never designed for levee breaks. When Katrina hit, most of New Orleans was evacuated. But the pump operators remained, despite the risk to their lives. They stayed to protect the city. And the story of pump station number six is not to be believed. Heavy rain started on Sunday, and by Monday morning, when the storm's 115 mile per hour winds crashed into the city, it had already dumped 10 inches of rain. By Monday mid-morning, the worst of the storm had passed, and this system, and the men who manned it for 24 hours straight, saved the city from the initial flooding. And then the levees broke. By late Monday morning, there were dozens of failures. 41 miles of gaping holes in New Orleans' protective barrier. The waters from Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne spilled into the city all day and late into the night. Because the pumps send water into the lake, they were now useless, just moving water in a circle. All the operators could do was focus on saving the stations. If they were destroyed during the initial flood, there would be no way to empty out the city later, and New Orleans would be lost for good. This pump is nearly 100 years old, but it's still going strong. Here's how it works. This wheel here is the motor. It turns at a high speed. That's the energy for the shaft, which is connected to the propeller inside here. A 12-foot in diameter propeller turns inside this housing. They turn on the vacuum power, and that brings up the water from both sides. Once this pump is primed, then the water's moving, and it goes out the other end of this into Lake Pontchartrain. This whole place, this whole station has 15 major pumps working in here. If they're all working at the same time, this place can move one million gallons of water per second. One of the pump operators, Rufus Burkhalter, was working in Pump House 6 non-stop during Katrina. So this is the control room for station number six. That's correct. When it became clear that Katrina was going to hit the city, Rufus sent his family to Houston and reported for work. Tell me about Katrina, the, what it was like here in this pump house that day. Scary. Mm. It, it, it was scary, but uh, we all had a job to do, and we pitched in and did it. We were getting rid of that wall. Yeah. We, we, I, we thought we was getting rid of that wall. On Monday morning, Rufus saw the water from the 17th Street Canal levee breach rushing towards the station. He ran inside and started sandbagging the door. And as fast as I was throwing sandbags, that water's coming in. The water was pushing the sandbags away. Water was pouring in, cascading down the stairs to the basement and the station's 660 volt transformers. And what happens then if it hits those transformers? The station goes up. Blows up. If these transformers are still hot, that's why we had to shut the power off. If we lose this, it, it's just... You lose New Orleans. Rufus ran straight to the control room and got the power shut down with just moments to spare. Because of his actions, this station survived and was back online about a week later, pumping the city dry. So your life is in danger here, all personnel. Why don't you guys just leave? Might be silly to say my job is the city, the New Orleans, the citizens, and the property right. that we are supposed to protect. We are obligated to be here. The St. Charles streetcar line in New Orleans and the San Francisco cable cars are the nation's only mobile national monuments.
of us know there's a problem with the levees in New Orleans. But the levees are just the tip of the iceberg of a crisis facing this city. New Orleans is sinking, and it's a matter of decades before the open ocean is at its door. That's because Mother Nature's best defense against the ravages of hurricanes, millions of acres of wetlands along Louisiana's coast, is disappearing at an insane rate. We're talking a football field every 45 minutes. In fact, every 2.7 miles of coastal wetlands soaks up storm surge like a sponge, reducing it by a foot. And as we've discovered, and as Hurricane Katrina proved, every foot in this underground city counts. Fortunately, there's a solution to the problem, and it's right underneath my feet. The key to getting this city back on track is New Orleans underground, and I'm going to find out how. Flooding is part of the natural cycle of the Mississippi Delta. But as the population grew here, so did the level of destruction every time the river overflowed the banks. One of the worst came almost 80 years before Katrina. It was the Great Flood of 1927. From Illinois to New Orleans, the Mississippi floodwaters caused $5 billion worth of damage and killed 246 people. The federal government stepped in, and over the next few decades, they built 2,000 miles of barriers along the river, straightened its course, and put it in a concrete straitjacket. The levee system made the river easier to navigate and ease the flooding, but it also started killing the Louisiana wetlands. Those wetlands aren't only a habitat for Louisiana locals. They also act as a natural sponge, absorbing the impact of violent storm surges that roar ahead of hurricanes like Katrina. I'm meeting a biologist named Chuck Villarubia. He's part of the group of scientists and engineers who are on the front lines of the effort to save Louisiana's coastline. 55 miles outside New Orleans is the Carnarvon Freshwater Diversion a facility designed to restore Louisiana's dying wetlands, a critical step in protecting New Orleans against the next monster storm. So this structure is a floodgate, essentially. Uh, essentially, but it's, it's used for coastal restoration. And we're trying to get the water from the Mississippi River yeah. over into the marsh, like used to happen when the river overflowed before the levees were here. So, Chuck, how does this diversion work exactly? There are five gates that allow water from the Mississippi River through these concrete uh, tubes over into the Southfall Channel and into the marsh. The diversion separates the Mississippi from a smaller channel 11 feet lower than the river. 20 feet below the surface on the Mississippi side are five concrete tubes blocked by metal gates. When activated, a large screw turns, lifting the gates. Pulled along by gravity, water surges into the tubes and out the other side. Rushing through the floodgates are the water and sediment that eventually rebuild the wetlands and protect the coast. Can we do it? Yeah, go ahead. Press the green button. That's all of them. That's it. OK, so now they're all rising up, and the water should be churning through. Yeah, once, we, once they get up, we'll start seeing water going through here, over there, 8,000 cubic feet per second. It's about 60,000 gallons a second. It could fill up an Olympic-sized swimming pool in about 11 seconds. This diversion and another even larger one were built in the early 90s. Now, in the wake of Katrina's devastation, there are plans underway to put in more of these structures. So you're looking at the urgent measures taken to repair the problem here. The marshlands need the water from the Mississippi River the water it always used to get the sediments to regrow itself. This is what they have to do to do it. You gotta open up the gates and let the Mississippi flow. The sediment flowing out of the Mississippi will help restore some of the 41 square miles of wetlands that were lost during Katrina. But it will take far more than Mississippi mud to save the wetlands. The only way to see what's lurking underwater and underground is to get a bird's eye view. Environmental scientist Darren Lee there? is taking me 1,500 feet up to see what's left of Louisiana's marshes, the last line of defense against the next Katrina. Of New Orleans, uh, as the crow flies, so to speak, and already 
almost everything is water beneath us. 50 years ago, this was solid marsh. Estimates are, you know, uh, by 2050, we'll lose another amount of, of land that's that's equal to Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. You know, it's funny, you, you talk about, we're going to look at it from a, a scientific standpoint, but if anybody ever took this amount of land away from some part of the United States by force, it would be war. I know. I mean, most of us that work in this, we, we see urgency, we see need, and, and we treat it as, you know, we've got to get to work on this. We've got to get this done or, or we're going to lose the war. Let's get down on the water and take a look at this thing. All right. From 1,500 feet up, the problem is all too clear. But to solve it, you have to hit the ground. 71 miles from New Orleans is Lake Boudreaux, where Darren and a group of scientists are heading up the Lake Boudreaux Marsh Creation Project, an attempt to repair some of the massive damage done. It will add 200 acres of marsh to a shoreline that's lost two to 300 feet in the last 50 years. Okay. Here we are in the middle of the swamp, huh? Right off here? Yep. So again, watch your step. It's okay. kind of soft sometimes. I can feel this ground moving under my feet. You can literally feel this whole piece of land moving. That's right. The old Cajuns used to refer to it as trembling prairie. Right. And you know, it was flat, it was grassy, and, and it's it, got a trampoline yeah, feeling to it. Buoyant. And that's what's so fragile. That's what's so fragile. Okay. So we're moving off of a natural marsh onto this a restoration project, right? That's right. You know, this, we're on top now of what they call the containment dike. So when they take sediment out of the lake here in front of us and, and pump it through the pipe from the dredge, it's going to come over this containment dike, and this is where we're going to restore the mark. This marsh being created along New Orleans coast is literally made up of the muck and mud scooped up from the bottom of the lake, turning the lake bottom into a thriving wetland. A hydraulic dredge is used to gather up the sediment. The boat lowers a large pipe with a cutter head on the end into the lake bed. The cutter stirs up the mud, which is sucked into the pipe just like a vacuum cleaner, then pumped along another line to shore, creating a life-saving marsh. So it's literally taking the underworld out there, the, the underground of this marsh. That's right. And pulling it up and putting it back over here. That's right. The brand new marsh is protected from heavy waves by this rock wall. The rocks are piled on a durable fabric to disperse the weight and keep them from sinking into the soft mud. This feature is temporary. It's only to contain the material. And then once the material consolidates, we're going to knock this down so that we let the tidal action work the water in and out. It becomes a, a, a working marsh again. The critters get in there. It becomes habitat. A living, self-sustaining marsh will absorb killer storm surges and protect the humans that built it. If there had been more marshes like these during Katrina, the damage to the Louisiana coast would have been greatly reduced. Take a look at this. This is the silt we're talking about. This is from the bottom of the Delta, the Mississippi Delta. I mean, we're in Louisiana, but this stuff here came down from Minnesota, Nebraska, Missouri. So we're not just talking about Louisiana here. We're talking about America all over my hands. Up next, with their city underwater, the remaining survivors had only one place to go. But even their shelter of last resort was on the brink of disaster. As Hurricane Katrina approached New Orleans, the city's mayor declared its largest building, the Louisiana Superdome, to be a shelter of last resort. But as the storm ripped across the Gulf, the massive stadium was torn apart by the unprecedented power of the winds. In the days after the storm, 30,000 people had to survive in the leaking dome. The world's largest fixed dome structure, the Superdome, was synonymous with the chaos of post-Katrina New Orleans. Today, it's up and running at full speed and has become a symbol of how New Orleans is defying all the odds and coming back. I'm going inside to meet Doug Thornton, who manages the dome and can give the insider's view on how the Superdome survived its darkest days. Welcome to the Superdome. Thank you very much. So this is the big place, huh? This is the big place. Nearly two million square feet of space under one roof. 
Before Katrina, the Superdome hosted six Super Bowls, the Pope, and the Rolling Stones, who packed this place with 91,000 fans. Look at this thing. Man, huge building. <laughs> you really don't get a sense until you're right in the middle of it. It's here. a vast space. We're on, we're on a floor that's 166,000 square feet of unobstructed, column-free space. Incredible. How big is that roof? Well, it's 440,000 square feet, 9.6 acres, and it's 270 feet from the floor to the apex at its highest point. That's 27 floors up. It was that massive roof peeling away like an onion skin that became an indelible image of the destruction of New Orleans. And Doug was in the thick of it all. I was here and the sound was so deafening. Imagine the wind riffling through those tiles and that metal deck vibrating against the frame of the building. It sounded like a subway or a roller coaster riding across the roof. 14,000 people were in the Superdome that Monday morning when the storm hit. They'd been streaming in since Sunday morning when the city officially declared it a refuge of last resort. Imagine 6,000 people seated in this lower section here that were huddled trying to protect themselves from the rain and the debris. Once the roof began to fail, we quickly moved those people out into the concourses to where they would be safe. That was when I was most fearful. I was afraid that we were going to lose someone to falling debris. By the time the storm died down on Monday afternoon, 70% of the roof was gone and the stadium was drenched. But everyone was safe. The 30,000 survivors owe their lives to the well-engineered structure above and to the unique structure deep below the stadium. If you stripped away the outer surfaces of the Superdome, you'd find 672 columns. Those columns all rest on concrete pads, which are supported by pilings. 15 one-inch square sticks, 165 feet long, driven 16 stories into the ground. These slender supports, over 5,000 in all, keep the Superdome from sinking. The pilings don't sink because they're held in place by friction with the particles of fine-grained clay compacted around them. It's the same principle as sticking a beach umbrella into the sand, only much bigger. Because the Superdome is perched two to three feet above sea level, the dome survived the initial storm surge. But the worst was yet to come. So the next morning, we awoke to the water lapping at our doorstep. It was four to five feet in certain sections of Poydra Street, nearly three feet on Gerard behind the Superdome. And the people just started coming in droves. They were being dropped off by helicopter. They were being brought here by large military trucks, these high water vehicles. They were floating their belongings and wading in neck high water. They were getting here any way they could. As flooding from the levee breaches filled up the city, 30 to 40,000 people sought shelter in the dome and stayed here for five days. I tell people all the time, this is a football stadium. We're equipped to handle people for four hours. It's not a hospital. It's not a hotel where you can handle people for four to five days mm -hmm. with no basic services, with very little power, very little water, no water pressure, no toilets, no way to remove trash, no way to even serve the food. As bad as it got in here, it could have been much worse. Only Doug and a few others knew that the dome was literally inches away from utter chaos. So day after Katrina, 6 a.m., you wake up and there's water outside your stadium. And I'm concerned that our generator is going to flood. Here's the generator. And of course, the generator was running. And you can see it only sits about 18 inches above the gray level. Yeah. So I walk over here to this door. And I peer out this small window. And as I peer out the window, I notice that there's three feet of water that's lapping up against this door. I see the water penetrating under the door, and I see it moving across the floor of the plant. The place is flooding. And I'm thinking it's like the scene out of a movie where you're in the engine room of a ship and you're taking on water. 
With the help of the National Guard, Doug and his crew sandbagged the door and built a mini dam around the generator. But by evening, there were 12 inches of water in the plant. We thought we had av avoided the worst. And then at 7 p.m., later that same day, we were told to expect eight additional feet of water. And of course, we already have a foot of water in the plant. We knew that eight feet, we would be completely yeah. uh, out of business here. If 30,000 desperate people were suddenly plunged into darkness, there would be mass deadly panic. So a handful of men kept a three-day vigil, observing the water levels and preparing to evacuate everyone to the parking structure. Here are the marks on the wall. You can see where the water was at the time. This is where it had to go to flood the generator and shut down the building. Fortunately for us, it rose two inches and stopped. We got through it and it was all well. That was a real close one. Very close. The Superdome was finally evacuated after six hellish days. Many expected the devastated Hulk would be torn down. But with state and federal support, 12 months and $200 million later, the dome was open again, completely refurbished, just in time for football season. It was so important for us to rebuild the Superdome in many ways. There were two reasons. One, the economic impact. I mean, this building means so much to our economy. Number two, the symbolism. It was the poster child for misery and suffering that the world saw so many days after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we could do to change that image was to repair it and rebuild it and do it quickly. If you can rebuild this stadium, then you can certainly rebuild the city. That is the thought. This is about a city trying to regain respect in the eyes of a nation. And it's so important for us to show the world that we can come back. Hurricane Katrina was a national tragedy that could have been avoided. Images from the aftermath of the storm left a painful scar on America. But it's what remains unseen below the city of New Orleans that created the disaster. And if this city has a fighting chance of surviving another monster storm, one that many predict is certain to come, the city's underworld will play a key role in saving the city's future.